in the book of Ephesians. Message 12 in a series in the book of Ephesians. Our message tonight is in the second chapter. In order to put it in its context, we'll read the first ten verses of the second chapter. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, if you ever had the experience of seeing a jeweler display his gems, I never did, for I was never in the market for any, but they have a very novel way of displaying the splendor of their diamonds. They roll them out on a black velvet, for only the blackest of background can bring to the forefront the remarkable beauty of their gems. So it is in this second chapter of Ephesians, that God sees fit to display the riches of his grace. The second chapter opens with a black velvet background. We saw that background this morning. None of us can see it and be the same again if we've seen it with our hearts. For to see with our hearts what we saw this morning in those first three verses of Ephesians 2 is a vision that will bring us before God receiving his mercy, falling upon his grace, learning what there is in Christ Jesus for us. After the meeting this morning, we were talking about how this thing seems so obvious to me that I am not so much concerned anymore about what people believe about Christ. And it may sound like a very strange statement to be made, but I'm not really concerned primarily with what you believe about Christ. The first thing that is of interest to me is what do you believe about yourself? For the order of God's conviction in the heart is sin, righteousness, and judgment. We learn nothing of God's righteousness in Christ, of the judgment of the cross, until we have learned about sin. Man must learn about himself before he learns about God. He must learn about himself before he learns about the Savior. He must know the truth in his heart, about his heart, before he can know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. I've met many who can say the correct words concerning Christ. They can tell you from their minds the theology that they hold about the Lord Jesus, and oftentimes is correct. But what is more important, have they ever seen themselves? Do they know themselves for what they are? Have they ever become convinced and persuaded of the Holy Spirit that they're lost? Now show me a person who knows himself to be that person we described in this morning's message. And I don't need to ask him what he believes about Jesus. I know what he believes about him. Show me a man who tells me he's not too bad, not as bad as others, better than some. Show me a man who says he doesn't believe all are totally bad, good in every man. Show me a man who says, I believe I must do my part, God will do his. Show me a man who says I'm doing the best I can or that I'm living by the Ten Commandments. 
living the best way I know how, and I need not ask him what he believes about Christ, for I know without asking. He believes Jesus will help him if he needs help. He believes that if he fails, Jesus will forgive him for his shortcomings. He believes that if he holds out faithful to the end, he will at last have a home in heaven with you all. But ask the man who knows that he is dead and trespasses and sins. Ask the man who knows that he is the hopeless slave of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Ask the man who knows in his soul that he is by nature the child of wrath. And I know that this man has learned something about the riches of God's mercy, the greatness of his love, and the eternal unfolding of his grace in Christ. Now we start verse 4 tonight with two words, but God. Now the diamonds are displayed. First the velvet background and now rolling out in plain view, but God. What would it have been had these two words not been found here, but God? Still dead in trespasses and sins, still walking according to the course of the world, still under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, still carried about by the spirit of disobedience, and still by nature the children of wrath, but God, but God, God who is rich in mercy, inexhaustible, the original says, in his mercy. The storehouse of God's mercy cannot be exhausted even though the whole world be dead in trespasses and sins, even though the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air, the devil, the spirit of disobedience and the lusts of the flesh and the mind have swept a whole human race away to judgment. God's mercy is capable. God's mercy is equal to the task. And his great love wherewith he loved us. The power of his wrath will not overshadow the greatness of his love. And yet the greatness of his love will not overlook the blackness of our sin. All are perfectly balanced in this God who steps from the curtains of eternity to bestow upon a lost and hell-deserving race all the riches of his mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And God, who is rich in not giving people what they deserve, steps forward with a way, with a scheme and with a plan, and more than that, with a blessed person that will lift men who are dead in the trespasses of their sins to the glory with him and clothe them with the righteousness of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, who is rich in mercy, now notice a reason is given, for instead of the word for, F-O-R, in verse 4, we have in the original this phrase, but God, who is rich in mercy, in order to satisfy his great love, in order to satisfy his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And again we are back to that greatest mystery of the gospel, the why behind the work of the cross. God gives no reason excepting to say that it is because of his great love wherewith he loved us. In order to satisfy his great love, and because he was inexhaustible in his mercy, he hath quickened us together in Christ, raised us together in heavenly places, and made us sit together with the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you're full aware of the meaning of the word love. The word love means a love that is called out of the heart, a self-sacrificial love called out of the heart due to the preciousness of the object love. And God, having a self-sacrificial love called out of his heart due to the preciousness of this world of lost sinners, and in order to satisfy this love, he quickened us together in Christ Jesus. Now I think one of the remarkable facets of this gem of his love, mercy, and grace 
is that he did not love us with this great love when we became Christians, after we were redeemed, after we had believed on Jesus. It was this great love that he must satisfy when we were yet sinners. For God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us when we were everything that we said we were this morning. He loved us when he saw us as he saw us this morning in his word. He loved us with a love that could not be satisfied short of the cross of Calvary when he saw our deadness, our sins, our trespasses, when he saw the spirit of disobedience at work in us, when he saw us as the hopeless puppets and slaves of sin, walking according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit of disobedience and the course of the world. God loved us when we were in that state, when we were in that place, when we were hopeless and helpless, and which all of you, I'm sure, will agree, when there was nothing whatsoever about us that was lovable and nothing about us that was lovely. God loved us then. And his love was of such a nature, was so great, so great, so insatiable was his love that in order to satisfy us, he could not rest just finding a way to pardon us. He could not rest just finding a way to remove the penalty. He could not rest finding just a way to bring us into a better relationship. He could not rest until he had raised us from our deadness. And he could not rest even when he had raised us, for raising us was not merely enough. He could not be satisfied in his great love until he had caused us to ascend right into his very throne room and sit down at his very right hand in Christ Jesus and be clothed with his own righteousness and be received as a son and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He couldn't be satisfied until he could look ahead to the ages that are yet to come and think of the pleasure he will derive in showing to all for eternity in the successive ages that are yet ahead the great riches of his mercy, the exceeding greatness of his kindness, the glories of his grace in saving us who are worthy and deserving of hell. But God, who is rich in mercy, in order to satisfy his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There are three words you should link together in your Bible with a pencil. One of these words is mercy, one is love, and one is grace. The work of saving a wretched sinner like myself, like you, involves, first of all, his mercy. God must be merciful, for he must not give us what we deserve. He must love us, for he must have a motive to do for us what he does. And God must be grace, for since we are dead in trespasses and sins, totally incapable of doing anything for ourselves, then whatever he does must be done by the purest of grace, for grace is giving us what we do not deserve. God, who is rich in his mercy, insatiable in his love, abounding in his grace, stepped into this blackest of scenes in Ephesians 2 and gave his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, while we were yet dead in trespasses and sins. Now, I think this is probably one of the clearest passages in the New Testament for the doctrine of identification. For here in these verses we find God telling us that we are so totally identified with the Lord Jesus Christ that when Christ was raised from the dead, we were raised. When he ascended into the glory, we ascended. When he sat down at the right hand, we sat down. When he enjoyed the heavenly places, we have enjoyed the heavenly places. And that's where we are tonight. Now, perhaps the doctrine of identification is hard for you to get hold of. It may seem like an optical illusion, a spiritual optical illusion. 
and it is in a way, but God so reckoned Christ to us and so reckoned us to Christ that in the eyes of God and in the mind of God and as far as fact is concerned, when God saw the Lord Jesus at the cross, he saw us there. He saw us coming before him in judgment. He saw us clothed in our iniquities, our sins, and our transgressions. He saw us pleading guilty at the bar of justice. He saw us standing condemned at the eternal throne. He saw us worthy and deserving of hell, separation from his presence for eternity. When God saw the Lord Jesus at the cross, it was us he saw. It was us he heard cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was us that was banished in outer darkness. It was us who was plunged into the deep. It was us who died under the wrath of God. It was us who had his wrath finally to fall upon us, and we were well deserving of it. And when we died, we went into the deep, and when God raised the Lord Jesus Christ up again from among the dead ones, when he delivered him from death unto life, he saw him as though it were us that were raised from the dead place and among the dead ones, crossing the great gulf into paradise and ascending into his heaven. It was us he saw come into his throne room by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was us he saw when he seated Christ at his right hand, he saw us accepted in this beloved Son. And when Jesus assumed the dignity and the majesty and the glory and honor of the presence of God, God saw us, his sons and daughters by faith in Christ, clothed with all of these riches and all of these glories. For he knew that as Christ was in that moment, so we who have believed in Jesus shall be for he has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And since God, who knows the beginning from the end, is the first and the last, who lives in the eternal present, whose every moment is now, God sees that we are as sure of that end as though we were already there. So when we sing Amazing Grace and we sing the last verse, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. We look forward to that day, but in the eyes of God we are already there, and we are already singing his praises, and we are already as sure of the presence of God as though we had been there 10,000 years, or as our brother used to tell us, as long as he lives, we live, and as long as Jesus is at the right hand, we not will be there, we are there. And as long as he's seated there, so are we. And as long as he's accepted there, so are we. What a wonderful thing to know that my standing with God is kept current by the Lord Jesus Christ. I do nothing to maintain any standing with God. I do not have a standing with God. I have a person standing there with God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my anchor, my scout, my forerunner, who has gone within the veil. His acceptance is mine. His offering was mine. His pardon was mine. His glory is mine. Whatever God has done to him, whatever God has said to him, whatever God has granted to him, he has granted to me, he has done to me, and he has done for me. And if you could practice never thinking of yourself apart from him, you would escape many of the snares of the devil and of the flesh, who seek to bring you into despondency and discouragement in your own heart by turning your eyes to your own self and making you to say, look what I am. But it is not what I am that matters to God tonight. It is what Jesus is that matters. Now, if you don't know this truth, the devil's going to get to you one of these days. If he hasn't already done it, he will. He's the accuser of the brethren. And I tell you that I fall under such accusation of Satan 
I'm not talking about from others. I'm talking about from my own wretched heart. I fall under such accusation of Satan, such constant accusation through the flesh, that I could never preach again, never. I wouldn't have the moral courage to stand before you people again, knowing what I am within, knowing what I am by nature. I wouldn't have the intestinal fortitude to stand up here in a position of opening God's Word if I didn't know the way of victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. I would be so defeated. I would be so discouraged. I would be so humiliated, so convicted, so downcast, so miserable, and so wretched. I wouldn't have the courage to stand here Satan comes to me and he points out the obvious to me. He causes me to look within. He gets me to making that morbid introspection that can end in nothing but discouragement and despondency and defeat. He shows me my heart for what it really is. And he says, look at you. And you call yourself a Christian. He reminds me of my inconsistencies, my sins, Sin that he knows about and sin that I know about. And he tells me God knows about it. And he tells me that God is looking upon me in this way. And he says, look at you, and you're supposed to be a Christian. Whatever should I tell him? And whatever can I tell him? Excepting what the Holy Spirit has taught me to tell him. Look at my Savior. Where is he tonight? Why he is at God's right hand? Do you find any fault in him? Is there any flaw in his righteousness? Is he spotted and blemished as I? Look at my Savior tonight. He is without sin. He is holy. He's undefiled. He has neither spot nor wrinkle nor blemish nor any such thing. Ah, Satan, look at my Savior tonight. God's eye itself can find no fault in him. <clears throat> Under the scrutinizing gaze of the holiness of an eternal God, yet there is no fault found in him and no charge has ever been laid to the elect of God who is Christ. Look at my Savior tonight. See him yonder in the glory, clothed, in the glory? Do you see him now with a name? Above every name. God gave him that name. God had the right to give him a name even above his own, if he so pleased. And God gave him a name which was above every name. Every name in heaven, every name on earth, every name beneath the earth, every name that has ever been named, God gave him a name which was greater. That means that God has made him more than any person, any creature, anything in heaven, earth, or beneath the earth. God has heaped upon him an abundance of glory and honor and riches and acceptance. Look at him tonight. Then know, Satan, that as he is, so am I. Then know that I am in him. Then know that my life is so hid with Christ in God. God himself says to me, your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more against you. So perfectly identified am I with him by faith in him. God sees my Savior. Then he sees me accepted. Accepted in the beloved. God's not looking at my own righteousness. He's looking at Christ's righteousness. This is what it means when we claim Christ as our righteousness. He is our righteousness. He is our standing with God. He is our eternal relationship with God. And as he remains, so shall we remain throughout eternity. Will he ever die? He will never die. Because I live, you shall live also, he says. He will never die. His standing will never change. This name which has been given him is an eternal name. And someday at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess this. He has a standing which shall never change. Throughout the endless ages of eternity, 
He will sit there in the splendor of his Father's glory. And all who are in him will find themselves safely hidden in the cleft of that great rock. This is indeed rich mercy, isn't it? This is indeed great love. Pity the poor religionist who believes that his standing is affected day by day by his failures and by his faults. Pity the poor religionist who can look no place but to himself and he can see nothing but defeat. Pity the poor religionist who must day by day look upon his own wretched heart feel even the condemnation and conviction of conscience and know that in everything he has fallen short of the glory of God. Pity the poor religionist who daily labors to bear a yoke that his fathers could not bear and his fathers before him, saving himself by his works. Pity the poor religionist who is more rigid than the Roman Catholic in his daily confession in order to keep his standing with God what he thinks it ought to be seeking ever to establish his own standing, his own relationship, his own righteousness in the sight of God, ignorant always that Christ is our righteousness in the sight of God. Now, my sins are forgiven me for his name's sake. They're not forgiven me because I pray. They're not forgiven me because I preach. They're not forgiven me because I'm a professing Christian, because I do works. They're not forgiven me because I confess them. They are not forgiven me because I go through any religious ritual that obtains that forgiveness day by day. My sins are forgiven me now, past, present, and future. My sins are forgiven me in the past, in the present, in the eternal future for the name's sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have offered to God the blood of the Lamb for all my sins. God has accepted him. I have offered to him my living Savior, and God has seated him in the glory. I have offered to him my priest, and God has honored him in the sanctuary of heaven. And now because he lives to ever make intercession for me, he is able to save me to the uttermost. My standing with God has nothing whatsoever to do with the way I conduct my life, with the way I respond to his will in my life, to my diligence in spiritual matters, or to my unfaithfulness in spiritual matters. For even if I believe not, he remaineth faithful, and he cannot deny himself. He has made me his son once and forever. I will be eternally his by the blood of the Lamb. I will come to glory gladly or reluctantly. I will be clothed in the image of the Lord Jesus as a babe or as an adult. I will be a source of eternal and abounding joy to him. I may be a source of small joy, but I will be a source of joy. He has begun his work in me. He will not quit it until the day of Jesus Christ. And when I am finally and fully and ultimately stood in his presence, made to stand in his presence like Jesus, he will look upon me and say, as we will hear Tuesday night, He is my workmanship in Christ Jesus. I created Him in Christ. He's the work of my hands. He is the object of my great love, the evidence of my mercy, the testimony of my grace. And you know that in that day we will all say, I am what I am. How? By the grace of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Well, you say, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all see that, I started to say. But you may say, well, this, this sounds like a rather loose type of doctrine. It sounds like it doesn't make any difference how we live, doesn't make any difference what we are, doesn't make any difference what we do, doesn't make any difference whether we sin or we don't sin, whether we confess our sins or we don't confess our sins. That is absolutely true in regards to our standing in the sight of God. And, and because I believe that, I'm bold enough to say that. It has nothing whatever to do with our standing in the sight of God. There is no such thing as a saved man getting lost. There's no way for you to get lost. There's no way for you to have your standing changed. Jesus is seated there for you and you're in him and that relationship can't be broken. You've been made one with him by being <coughs> baptized into him by the Holy Spirit. Nothing will ever change that. He will never lose a single one of his sheep. 
when the great shepherd comes sweeping into the fold of glory, he will have every sheep in his flock accounted for. We say, isn't that dangerous doctrine to teach? It would be if it weren't for one thing. It's dangerous to the professing Christian. It is the most dangerous doctrine in the world to the professing Christian because this is just exactly the out he wants. This is just exactly the excuse he needs. This is just exactly the open door that he's been waiting for. Ah, he says, now I can live as I please, do as I will. Of course, I'm saved and once saved, always saved. And so the riches of God's mercy and the abundance of his grace and the greatness of his love becomes a license to sin for the professing Christian. He delights in eternal security, for he can be what he will, act as he will, do as he please. He is not bothered by conviction of conscience, resting in the fact that having professed Christ, he is once saved, always saved. But my dear brethren, it has no effect whatever upon the true believer in Jesus Christ. For you see, something has happened in the believer. His nature has been changed. He doesn't want to live like the devil. He isn't looking for an open door of escape. He isn't asking for a license to sin. His attitude towards sin has changed. And he can't help himself. The things he once loved, he now hates. And the things he once hated, he now loves. Old things are passing away and all things are becoming new. And the more you tell him that he can't get lost, and the more you tell him of the riches of God's mercy, grace, and love, the humbler he becomes, the more broken he lays at the feet of Jesus, and the greater his desire to serve him, to love him, and to be a source of joy to him. Now, if you're not really saved, and you're just hiding behind the profession of Christianity, you'll find a reason to sin anyway. I don't mean by that that Christians don't sin. I mean by that that the professing Christian and the real Christian have an entirely different attitude towards sin. I sin. Oh, indeed I do. The more I learn of myself, the more I realize I sin. And I thank God for the consciousness of sin. Oh, what a horrible thing if I didn't know anything about sin. What in the world is this man saying? This man is saying that had I never known sin, I would never have known Jesus. Had I never known sin, I would have never known the grace of God. I mean not that I am glad for all the sin that I have committed. It is not that. I am glad that I know what a sinner I am. And I'm glad that daily I'm reminded of what a sinner I am. For daily as I'm reminded of what a sinner I am, I'm reminded of what riches of grace has been operative in my heart and life. Oh, yes, I sin. And the more I learn of the first three chapters of Romans, the more I see myself as a perpetual manufacturer of sin. The more I see myself with a nature and heart that is completely defiled and depraved and corrupt, violent in its opposition to anything of righteousness and anything of God, the more I see myself, if not restrained by the Spirit of God, an absolute spiritual rebel and an anarchist in every sense of the word. The more I learn about myself, the more I realize what a sinner I am. And let me tell you, in every conscious experience, knowing what a sinner I am, I realize what the Scripture means when it says of Peter that he went out and wept bitterly. We sin and we're conscious of it, but inside there is that always weeping, always groaning, always heart sick and heart broken within, longing for that day when our bodies shall be changed and the final release shall be effected. These bodies of death and humiliation will no longer mar the blessedness of our fellowship. Quite a difference between just professing to be saved and enjoying the course of the world, the influence of Satan and the lusts of the flesh, isn't it? There's no believer can ever enjoy sin. He can commit it, but he can never enjoy it. That's the 
Well, that's the sad part about it, isn't it? Let me repeat that. That's worth repeating. The believer can sin, but he can never enjoy it again. <laughs> he can sin. Yes, he can. <laughs> I've thought of things down through these 18 years. You'd be amazed at the things I've thought of to do and think of and say and meditate on. And wonder if I could do this and wonder if I could do that. <laughs> and I've concluded I could do it all. And I would do some of it and maybe all of it if I could just figure out a way to enjoy it. But I can't find any way to enjoy it. I become the most wretched, most miserable man on the face of the earth to even entertain the thoughts. Do you? Isn't it wonderful it's that way? <laughs> now, people with religion aren't that way. They restrain themselves in public and they indulge themselves in private and enjoy it. But the, sin, the, the sinner say, but grace can't enjoy it. Sometimes I think it would be nice if I could just have a fling at sin and enjoy it a little bit. But I can't. I can't because his seed remains in me. And he cannot sin. That's seed that remains in me. And he can allow me no pleasure in sin. I can't find the pleasure in sin that I once found. For he has done something to my heart. My heart has ever turned in another direction. And even though often with my hands I obey the law of sin, yet always in my mind I am fixed upon him. What is this strangeness of the believer's life? It is his identity, identity with the Lord Jesus. It is his union with a risen Christ. It is his seating in the glory. It is his, his partaking of Christ's life. It is his fellowship with the Lord Jesus. It is his oneness of life, his relationship to him. No, it isn't dangerous to tell the saints that their standing can never be changed. It isn't dangerous to tell the saints that they're seated in the glory. Or to tell them that only makes them realize that their conversation is in heaven that they're pilgrims and strangers. They're wayfaring people waiting for that day when our bodies shall catch up with where God has already placed us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, if you will, please, that there are two reasons given in this passage for God's moving toward us in his grace. In verse 4, he gives the reason of his great love. In order to satisfy his great love, he did what he did. In verse 7, he tells us of another motive which reaches into the future. His great love reached out of the past and looking forward to the future... He quickened us, gave us life, raised us up in Christ, seated us in the glory in heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The word ages means and could well mean dispensation, that is, periods of time, eons. Successive dispensations of time successive periods of time. Now, eternity will be timeless, but in order that we with finite minds might lay hold of what eternity really is, God gladly explains it to us in the terms of ages. The ages will roll on and on. And I understand from this passage that there will be successive ages in eternity. Each one filled with with the revelation of his exceeding riches, of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The word show, as H-E-W, in the original is exhibit. Each age will have its special exhibit. 
its special revelation, its special unfolding of how really great God's riches of his grace in his kindness toward us has been through Christ Jesus. These are big words and they're hard to put together. So I'll make little words out of them. You often wonder what you were going to do in heaven. <coughs> Lots of things to see there. <laughs> say, say it's quite a city, this new Jerusalem where we will be. For well, the new Jerusalem is specially prepared as the bride of the Lamb. That's what we are. So we're going to dwell there with Jesus. It's going to be kind of our honeymoon apartment. Others are going to live on the world, a new world. And there will be a new earth, a new earth and a new heaven. God will dwell in his new heaven and men will dwell upon his new earth. But we will dwell in his new Jerusalem. We will be with Jesus. And wherever the Lamb goes, we will go with him. For we will be his helpmeet and his lover, his beloved throughout eternity. This is the special relationship that God has given to us who believe in the age of grace on Jesus. What a privilege. What a joy. The Old Testament saints will never share it. Not even John the Baptist will share the embraces of the bridegroom. He will be the friend of the groom, but we are his bride. And I've often wondered, what are we going to do throughout the successive ages of eternity? Well, there's lots to see in the city. It's a wonderful city. The streets are paved with pure gold, clear as crystal. The wall which stretches some 6,000 miles, 200 feet high, garnished with every manner of precious stones, with 12 gates, each one made and constructed of a single pearl. Inside this city is the river of life. On the shore of the river of life is the tree of life, bearing 12 manner of fruit, each in its season. The throne of God will be there, but there will be no temple, for the Lord God Almighty and his Lamb will be the temple thereof. Oh, every time I think of that, no church building in heaven, it thrills my soul. No church building in heaven, there is no temple there. The Lord God and the Lamb are the temple, and uh, there are going to be a lot of Christians go to heaven before they learn what church really means. Church is his body. The church is the temple which he has built for a habitation of God through his spirit made of living stones like us tonight. It's a wonderful city. There will be a wonderful number of people there. Oh, think of the saints that will be there. Think of those from the very early days in the book of Acts. Cornelius will be there, I'm sure. I'm sure that Stephen will be there. I'm sure that Paul will be there. The apostles, the early Christians, you'll see such people like the Philippian jailer and Lydia there. You'll see that girl that was once demon-possessed. You'll see so many there that we've read about in the Scriptures. And from that time down until now, all who have believed in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ will be there. What a day it will be and what a day of rejoicing it will be when all of the fellowship of the body of Christ will be realized. All the family will be at home with God. The circle will be complete. We're seated about the Lamb. Now after we've seen each other, and after we've viewed the city, and after we've walked the golden streets, examined those pearly gates, for well, they indeed are pearly, walked around the whole length of the 200-foot wall garnished with precious stuff, and examined every spire and every steeple of whatever there is to look at, set by the tree of life and by the river of life. When we've gazed upon the face of Jesus, what shall we do throughout eternity? Well, I'm glad God has something in store for us because he knows how we are. We can't just be content to do nothing, can we? He has something in store for us. Each age will have a special revelation. We're going to go to God's eternal school. And in each age, God is going to exhibit and show openly to the saints some new facet of his mercy and his grace and his kindness to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, I hesitate to say this because it sounds so completely opposite of what we think of in heaven. Yet I'm compelled to say it because of a divine principle which I have seen to be absolutely true and I know shall be eternally true that I think that a part of this revelation God's great mercy his kindness and his riches of love and grace in Christ has to almost contain some element of the revelation the future revelation of what we were by nature and what we are without Christ I can't conceive of any comprehension of any more mercy and grace and love unless there be a further revelation of what it means to be lost. Now, that's a strange thing to say, and maybe I shouldn't say it, but I've been impressed for a long time with the fact that in the book of Revelation where it gives the final state of things, that the saints are always singing unto the Lamb in remembrance not only of what he did but of their sins as well. For they sing, Worthy is the Lamb. He hath redeemed us from what? Our sins. Now, a man couldn't sing that in heaven without knowing what that word meant. Man couldn't sing it without knowing more about what it meant than he knows now. A man couldn't keep on singing throughout eternity about the worthiness of the Lamb without learning throughout eternity of the unworthiness of his own heart. Now, I don't want to go to school in heaven and learn any more about sin. <laughs> but I think in heaven, the pit from whence we are digged will grow blacker in our sight as the riches of his grace grow greater. Now, I have two verses. Now, this may be a very, this might be, you might just leave me right here and say, I can't go with you here. This is teaching I don't like. But your two verses bother me. I'm just throwing you out the things that bother me. First of all, in regards to the saints, we shall follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. You ever read that? It's in the book of Revelation. And it tells about our eternal relationship to the Lord Jesus. He won't go anyplace. We won't be with him, right? He won't see anything we won't see. He won't be conscious of anything we won't be conscious of. He won't know anything we won't know. Wherever he is, we will be. And as he is, so shall we be. But when we see him as he really is, we are to be made like him. Couple that with this thought. That those who are lost, are said to be cast into the lake of fire where they shall be tormented day and night in the presence of the Lamb and of his holy angels. And somehow or another, I think we're going to have a comprehension of hell as we also have a comprehension of heaven. Not in such a way as to be a morbid source of, of despair to us, but we will see forever the eternal justice and righteousness of God. We will see forever the eternal glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will see and know forever the pit from whence we have been digged. And oh, won't our song be sung with lusty voices in that day about the preciousness of the blood of the Lamb and the greatness of God's mercy and His grace and His kindness to us. Oh, let me tell you, it's a wonderful thing to be saved. It's a horrible thing to be lost. God says so. It's a terrible thing. It's an awful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. But oh, what a wonderful thing to fall into the hands of a God who has become our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of these successive ages. Oh, I like that. <laughs> It's like one series of messages ending and another beginning. We look back on a series of messages and we say, well, I don't know how we could be blessed any more than we were blessed in those messages. But here we start on a new series and we learn new things and we see more of God's glory and we find that we've been blessed just as much and more 
than we were in those past messages. Think of us in heaven. God will finish one revelation, and we will say there could not be any more to learn. But God will say the half has never yet been told. And age after age after age after age will roll on and still the glory of his grace in Christ to us wretched sinners will be new. And still the revelation of his kindness to us will be fresh as it was the first day we learned it. Proof positive of that is in your own experience. I was saved 18 years ago. And I never would have believed 18 years ago that 18 years later, God's grace, the joy of being saved, the sweetness of his fellowship could increase. I would have thought to have grown old by now if someone would have said 18 years ago, well, how are you going to feel 18 years from now? Will he be as fervent? Will you be as excited? Will you be as thrilled? Will you be as joyful? Will you be as glad? Will this reality be as real? Will the fellowship be as sweet? I would have had to say, well, probably the edge will have worn off of it some, but it will remain basic. But, oh, listen, it has increased. I love him more tonight than I ever loved him 18 years ago. Seems that I do. I know him better than I ever knew him then. His grace is so much richer to me now than it was then. I'm so much more thankful, grateful in his presence for what he has done. There's a greater realization, appreciation, comprehension of the riches of his grace. And oh, as it enlarges and enlarges and enlarges in my heart and mind, it spreads before me like the great oceans of the world, boundless in their depth and endless in their reach. And I know something of what Paul prays for in his next chapter, that we might know the height and breadth and length and depth of the love of Christ. Inexhaustible, and it will take eternity to tell it, and eternity will roll around, and still the half will never yet be told. Do you know why that's true? Because we will never be God. We will always be limited in our comprehension. We will never attain oneness with God so as to be God ourselves. We are God's sons. We are God's children. And even though we have borne the image of the earthy and shall bear the image of the heavenly, we will always be short of him so that there will be something new to unfold throughout the endless ages of eternity to us. I'm glad for that because I once thought in my childish way that the day I went to heaven and know everything, and if man couldn't learn anything, what would be use of being there? <laughs> we're going to learn something every day in heaven. And you know what we're going to learn? To learn about Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? The Holy Spirit is going to tell us about Jesus every day. I like to, 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 to think of it in, in uh, well, just in real plain terms. I like to think of being in heaven with the saints. It'd just be one long assembly. <coughs> Only I won't be, I won't be teaching. Won't be any human teaching. God will be teaching us. And he say, now today he will address the assembly. I want to unfold to you some of my riches. I want to show you my great kindness to you through Christ. And he will begin to unfold through the ministry of the Holy Spirit just like he does now the riches of the glory of Christ. He will take the things written in the scriptures. I think the word of God is going to remain because heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word will never pass away. His word is established in heaven. I I don't want to go to heaven if his word's not going to be there. (laughs) And he will unfold his word like he did on the day that he was on the road to Emmaus, beginning with the prophets, with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he will expound all of those things which are written therein concerning himself. Every Bible question we ever had will be answered. Everything we ever wondered about will find a fulfillment. Everything that ever troubled us will be explained. Every seeming perplexity and contradiction will be cleared up. We'll be sitting there forever saying such things as, well, now I know. 
Well, no wonder I thought like I did, and no wonder I felt like I did, and no wonder things worked as they did in my life. All the unexplained things in our lives will find an explanation. Naughty problems will be solved, and the unanswerable questions will be answered. We'll be just like the Queen of Sheba, for when she journeyed up to see Solomon and came to his palace, saw the richness of his table, the joy of his servants, and sat at his feet and heard him expound the riches of his wisdom. She went away saying the half has never yet been told. And so shall we in those ages to come. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for thy word tonight. You take this word that has been preached and use it in our hearts, Father, as we know you will. And we just ask that of it, you would make us to love you, to comprehend, appreciate, and be thankful for the Lord Jesus. Work in our hearts and lives, Father, that you might find some joy now in us. Help us, Father, to be obedient sons and daughters, loving sons and daughters. Oh, Father, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ shall be manifest more and more in our lives. For we know this brings glory to you and joy for him. Father, for those in this assembly who may be unsaved tonight, we shall continue to watch before thy throne in prayer. The age of grace will not close and leave them behind. Lord, we're expecting Jesus. We believe he may come at any moment, perhaps tonight. Oh, what fools they shall be to be left behind and realize that they had the inexhaustible grace of sitting under the sound of the word of God and rejecting Christ. Oh, Father, we pray tonight that if there are any in this assembly yet unsaved, they should get saved tonight, should look to the Holy Spirit through thy word for faith to trust in Jesus. Pray, Father, that Jesus may soon come. We long to see, not merely to escape earth's problems, but, Father, we long to see him because our heart is in heaven. We're homesick. We wish we were there tonight. We want to see Jesus. We want to see those who have been redeemed by his blood, and we want to see you and in your bosom rest. We pray that I would send him soon, and we pray to him, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Your people long for you. We wait on thee. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.